All right, well, good evening, everyone. I pray that uh, your week has been, it's been good and had a good morning, a good afternoon of, of rest. Well, tonight we finish up our seminars on intentional living and the spiritual discipleship. And tonight our focus is on worship. And so I'm going to open this up with prayer, and then we're going to get into the, uh, the, the lesson tonight from Capitol Hill on, on worship. Father, we thank you again for this evening, and we thank you for each one here. And this the, the last six weeks of study and uh, the time to be devoted to think about how we live intentionally for the glory of God and how we grow in grace and truth. Father, I pray as we think about worship tonight that you would teach us, and knowing that we were created for worship, Lord, help us learn to do that in a way that pleases you and in, in a way that builds us up as the church, the people of God, and individual followers of Christ. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes. Oh, I do. Oh, they're not down here. I came right out of elders' meeting. I'm done. I just didn't have them in here. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started so we can get out and plenty of time to have our discussions. All right, we start with the introduction tonight, and I should have, Jimmy, is it, I, did you, I put it under the Jimmy one. It's not in? It's been a long day, Rusty. All right, let's go ahead and get started as we think about worship. Your introduction starts with a question. How often do we worship God every week? The way we answer that question depends on how we understand what worship is. Is worship only something that we do when we come to church on Sunday? Or is worship more than that? I've always said you don't come to worship, um, or you, you don't come to church on Sunday, but you are the church seven days a week, right? I'm ringing like crazy. You want me? Would you rather be on my mic or this mic? Okay. So we got two two goals today: to hear what the Bible says about worship, and then also to understand the relationship between worship and spiritual disciplines. Worship is central to the purpose of our lives. The Westminster Assembly said as much in the, their shorter catechism where the question is, what is the chief end of man? Does anybody know the answer to this question? It's a very famous answer. What is the chief end of man in the Westminster Shorter Catechism? That's right. Hey, Misty, we, uh, Misty learned some stuff from me over the years. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So when we think about worship, we must first determine what that basic duty is. That duty is defined by God who created us in his image and then redeemed us in the blood of his son, Jesus. So we unpack that catechismic statement, cate catechism statement. Uh, what does it mean to glorify God? Tom and Wat Thomas Watson says it consists of four things. Appreciation, adoration, affection, and, subject and subjection. Appreciation is to glorify God, is to set God highest in our thoughts. It means to abound in thanksgiving toward him for what he has done for us through Jesus Christ. So that's appreciation. And then there's adoration. To adore God is to ascribe to him all honor and praise. It is to acknowledge that he alone is worthy of all our reverence and worship. And then third is affection. Affection is to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Our entire person is given to love the one who is altogether lovely. And then finally, subjection. To dedicate ourselves completely in obedience to God, we submit to his will and are ready to serve him. Subjection is how a believer enters the kingdom. Romans 10 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So subjective, subjection is not only how we enter the kingdom, 
but it's also how we live in the kingdom. Philippians 2, 5 through 7 speaks to the attitude. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, and it goes on, and it says, ultimately, what did he do? He emptied himself. He subjected himself uh, to the Father. So in summary... Faith in the person of Christ makes worship possible. The outcome of our faith is a love for Christ and it's accompanied with the emptying emptying of ourselves. Worship then involves a life that is wholly directed toward God as Lord of all and the Savior of the redeemed. So therefore, spiritual disciplines are a means of growing in godliness that find our place in a life completely consecrated to worship. That's the role that spiritual disciplines have. It grows us, in, grows us into godliness so that we have a life that's consecrated to God in worship. We mentioned Romans 12, 1 this morning. I'll mention it again tonight. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Why should we worship God? Well, Revelation 4 and 5 gives us two reasons. They are the fact that he is, number one, our creator, and then secondly, our redeemer. As we look at creator, Revelations 4, 10, and 11 speaks to this role or this uh, characteristic of God. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So God created us. Not only did he create us, but he also redeemed us. We also see this song in heaven in Revelation 5, 9 through 14. It says, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain by your blood. You have ransomed the people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that's in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Our choir sings a song uh, that reflects those same words, a song that's being sung in heaven right now about the person of Christ. So we belong to God twice over. First by means of creation and second by means of redemption or the price that God paid to save us from his own judgment upon our sins. God is a God on mission to save sinners through the cross. This theme of our missions is founded on worship. As John 4.23, Jesus descri- in John 4.23, Jesus describes the advance of the gospel as the work that the Father is doing to seek true worshipers. A true worshiper is one who worships in spirit and in truth. Pastor John Piper puts it this way. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. And that kind of strikes a Baptist kind of like, kind of of hard, right? I mean, it kind of rubs it. What do you mean missions is not the goal of the church? I mean, we raise money for, uh, you know, North American missions and international missions. The Great Commission is to go make disciples of all nations. But Piper makes this very clear what he's getting at. He says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. And that quote has always impacted me because Jesus has called us to make disciples of all nations because all the nations right now are not worshiping God the way he is worthy. And so we do missions to make worshipers for the king This brings us to the second heading as we talk about understanding worship, understanding worship. Three central concepts of worship are in the scriptures, homage, service, and reverence. So what do we mean by worship? I think it's interesting to note that 
Nowhere in Scripture is worship actually defined. But when key biblical terms of worship for worship are examined, it's clear the central co concepts of worship biblically are homage, service, and reverence. So let's look at those three words. First, homage. The Hebrew verb most commonly translated to worship literally, literally means bend oneself over at the waist. Exodus 34, 8 says, And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. So he bent himself over at the waist before God. This is the second giving of the law in the Old Testament. This gesture expressed surrender or submission to God. It expressed recognition of God's majesty and holiness and a desire to acknowledge him as king. Contrasted with this term for worship is the frequently used term you are a stiff-necked people, referring to those who aren't willing to bow themselves over to God in worship. So that's homage. Second idea or concept within this uh, the defining biblical worship is service. <clears throat> Another Hebrew term often translated to worship literally means to serve. The language of service implies that God is a great king who requires faithfulness and obedience from those who belong to him. This implies devotion to God as a pattern of life. Deuteronomy 12, 3 and 4 says, You shall tear down their altars and dash into pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their God and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God that way. And so service. Thirdly, reverence. It's this final concept that's bound up in biblical worship. A final group of terms that was used to indicate the fear, reverence, or respect due to God. This involved keeping God's commandments, walking in his ways, turning away from evil, and serving him. Psalm 95, 6 says, Oh, come and let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. In the Old Testament, worship is focused on the, at the sanctuary appointed by God. It follows the rituals laid down by God and facilitated by the priesthood that he has ordained. At the same time, such worship is only pleasing to God when it's accompanied by sincere obedience to God from the heart. In the New Testament, the same terminology of worship is transformed to portray the work of Christ and the response that pleases God. Jesus, our high priest, fulfills the types and shadows of the old covenant and replaces the way in which we approach God. Jesus' incarnation, death and resurrection and ascension makes it possible for us now to engage with God. Acceptable worship means approaching or engaging with God on terms that he proposes and in the manner in which he makes possible. True worship is revealed by God and it is made possible by his redeemed work. I want to just make a note here and to say a big part of what they're saying here is worship is not whatever you want it to be that we don't get to define worship we don't get to describe what are the concepts that inform what what worship is uh, I've, I've told this story in the past I'll tell it again right here quickly uh, another church I pastored before Mount Gilead uh, one of the things that people were doing when we started baptizing is that um, just kind of spontane spontaneously people started clapping and saying, saying amen. And uh, from time to time, people were in worship. They'd raise their hands or they'd say amen when the preacher was preaching. And uh, Miss Dolores, some of the folks started getting upset. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and uh, this, this, this one senior adult lady, you know, came to me and said, I had a problem with, with, with those kind of things, and basically was telling me, you gotta tell those people to stop that. And I told her, I said, you know, I can't tell them to stop it, because God already said they could do it, you know? And her response was, well, Bradley, we don't have to worship exactly like the Bible shows us. To, me, to which my response it was, then how do you know what you're doing is worship at all? Because that's where we learn what worship is. God's word defined by God. So, 
That brings us to the means of acceptable worship are found in revelation and redemption. First, God has revealed himself through his word. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God at Mount Sinai set forth in great detail the pattern for acceptable worship. Israel was to abide by these regulations in order to worship God in an acceptable way. Any deviation was regarded as idolatry. Besides these ritual stipulations, the Ten Commandments governed Israel's personal relationship with God. Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, God insists that he be approached in accordance with his word. This passage goes on to say, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put it and put the fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed, consumed them, and they died before the Lord. And then Moses and Aaron said, then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Similarly, in the New Testament, we encounter commands on how to live and also stipulations for public worship. The New Testament also makes clear that the Bible is central in public worship. 1 Timothy 4.13, Paul commands Timothy to devote himself to, quote, the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Ligon Duncan writes that when we gather for wor corporate worship, and when I say corporate worship, by the way, I mean we gather collectively. I got in trouble one time for using that phrase, a corporate worship. Um, and that, that was actually from someone here. They were upset that I was making it too biz worship too business-like because it sounded like corporation. I was like, that's, that's not what it means. It's a, it's, a, it's a theological term that's used to describe the collection of God's people corporately coming together and worshiping as one. And so he says, this is Ligon Duncan, that corporately, when we gather for corporate worship, we should read the Bible, hear the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible, and see the Bible as it's displayed in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Don Whitney writes, Bible reading and preaching are central in public worship because they are the clearest and most direct, most extensive presentation of God in the meeting. God alone determines how he is to be worshipped. This is what is meant by what is called the regulative principle. This principle refers to how scripture must shape and regulate our corporate worship. The principle states that nothing should be required, be required as essential in corporate worship except that which is commanded by the word of God. Now, within the concept of worship, extremes always get you in trouble. And the two extremes that can lead us away from New Testament worship are... Exper exper experientialism. I can't say that word. Exper experientialism. Experientialism. Did I say that right? Close enough. And intellectualism. I can say that one. So, J.I. Packard, in his book, A Quest for Godliness, gets into this problem with experientialism. He says this. Their outlook, it's basically what he's talking about there, people that only define worship by, by means of their experience in worship, okay? And there's a problem with that extreme. He says, their outlook is one of casual haphazardness and fretful impatience of grasping after novelties, entertainments, and highs, and of valuing strong feelings above deep thoughts. They have little taste for solid study, humble self-examination, disciplined meditation, and unspeakable unspectacular hard work in their callings and their prayers. They conceive the Christian life as one of exciting, extraordinary experiences rather than res resolute, rational righteousness. They dwell continually on the themes of joy, peace, happiness, satisfaction, and rest of the soul with no balancing reference to the divine discontent of Romans 7 or the fight of faith of Psalm 73 or the lows of Psalm 42, 88, and 102. Uh, through their influence, the spontaneous, uh, some of these words I can't say, uh, 
I'll just use this word, the spontaneous joy of simple, the simple extrovert comes to be equated with healthy Christian living, and I might add, worship, while the saints of less sanguine and more complex temperament get driven almost to distraction because they cannot bubble over in their prescribed manner. In their restlessness, these exuberant ones become uncriti uncritically credulous, reasoning that, that the more odd and striking an experience, the more divine, supernatural, and spiritual it must be. And they scarcely give the scriptural virtue of, of steadiness a thought. So that's one side of the extreme, saying worship is the quality of my worship is defined by my experience at the moment. But then there's another extreme over on the other side called the intellectualist. J.I. Packer discusses this. He writes, constantly they present themselves as rigid, argumentative, critical Christians, champions of God's truth from whom orthodoxy is all upholding and defending their own view of the truth, whether Calvinist or Arminian, dispensational or Pentecostal, national church reformist or free church separatist, or whatever it might be, is their leading interest, and they invest themselves undistinctively in this task. There is little warmth about them. Relationally, they are remote. Experiences do not mean much to them, winning the battle for mental correctness is their own great purpose. They see, truly enough, that in our anti-rational, feeling-oriented, instant gratification, culture, conceptual knowledge of divine things is undervalued. And they seek with passion to right the balance at this point. They understand the priority of the intellect well. The trouble is that intellectualism, expressing itself in endless campaigns for their own brand of right thinking, is almost, if not quite, all that they can offer. For it is almost, if not quite, all they have. They too, so, they too, so I urge, need exposure to the Puritan heritage for their maturing. And that's a, boy, that's, that's a lot of words to say. Worship couldn't, shouldn't be totally your experience at the moment and your quality of worship shouldn't be bound up completely and fully to its fullest end in rational thought. There should be worship that combines both spirit and truth, that combines proper right view of the word and your experience of God in the word. Now the Christian life of worship, he says this, is not a quest for experience or intelligence, even though both are part of what it means to be human and more importantly spiritual. spiritual. It is a quest for an intimate relationship with God in the person of Jesus Christ. That's a good way to think about worship. It is a quest for an intimate, intimate relationship with God in the person of Jesus Christ. All right. That now brings us to the second part of how God reveals himself. That God has revealed himself supernaturally in his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And then John 1, 8 no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made known him. He, are, he has made him known. Scripture bears witness to the ultimate revelation of God in Christ. God fully and finally manifested himself in the person of his son. Jesus Christ is thus at the center of the New Testament thinking about worship. The revelation of God in Christ has brought salvation to all who would repent of their sins and trust in Jesus to save them. He has revealed himself not only through the word and his son, but also he has revealed himself through creation. Psalms 19, 1 through 3, the psalmist declares, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. And then Romans 1, 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his internal, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in these things that have been made. So they are without excuse. 
the beauty of a sunrise and sunset, the crashing of the surf, and the awesome display of a thunderstorm all evoke our spontaneous awe of God. Such scenes give us glimpses, it gives us glimpse of God's greatness, majesty, wisdom, and power. However, we can only know God and worship him through what he has revealed in the special revelation of scripture. So what he's speaking about that, and this is, I think, important to know. You think about where do we go on vacation often? I know my wife likes to go to the beach, right? She loves to lay it out on the beach and look at the ocean and just sit there, right? Maybe we read, maybe we do some things, but, uh, and then we've like gone to the Grand Canyon. What do we do at the Grand Canyon? Stand and look. Why do we do that? Well, you know what that is? We stand there and we look at this ocean that is so big and so massive, our, we can't get our minds around it. You know, some I heard a comedian say one time, look at, look at all that water and that's just the top of it, right? Um, and so there's something about the sea, something about the mountains, something about the Grand Canyon that draws us, that we stand in awe of it. What is that? What are we doing when we stand in awe? That's worship. It's, it, to a degree, it's worship of, it's recognition of the awesomeness of the God who created it, that we're being drawn to that, to enjoy that feeling of awe, that feeling of being small. Because that, I mean, that's what happens when you stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon. You feel small. It's what happens when you stand at the edge of the sea. You feel small. I'm, I'm a big stars person. It's what happens when I look up at the stars on a crystal clear night. I feel small. And I think that's part of what worship is. It's when we stand before a holy, mighty God, the God of the Word, we feel small, yet we feel full in our awe of Him. That's the way I take it. Okay. Fourth, God has revealed himself, excuse me, God has not only revealed, but God has redeemed us through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament tabernacle and temple. He is the decisive means of reconciliation between God and sinful humanity. He's the center of salvation and the blessing for all nations. Christ makes possible a new restored relationship with the Father by means of his death resurrection, ascension, and subsequent ongoing outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Christ's death is the ultimate sacrifice provided by God to cleanse his people from the defilement of sin. Christ's death is, it also consecrates his people to himself in a relationship of heart obedience. We do not draw near and engage with God on the basis of our own merit but on the finished work of Christ's death and resurrection. If we are in Christ, we can approach God with the assurance that our sins have been forgiven and that we are reconciled to fellowship with God. David Peterson wrote this. He said, fundamentally, worship in the New Testament means believing the gospel and responding with one's whole life and being of whole life and being to the person and work of God's Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. I think that is a good insight about worship. And next we move to the manner of worship. This worship we've already mentioned a bit. It should be in spirit and truth. John 4, 23 through 24, at, at Jesus meeting with the woman at the well, he says, But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. In John, in John 4, 20 through 24, a Samaritan woman inquires about the appropriate place to worship. This leads Jesus to speak more fundamentally about how to worship God acceptably. It is in spirit and truth. This truth means that worship is essentially God-centered, made possible by the gift of the Holy Spirit, and in personal knowledge of and conformity to God's word made flesh. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one who has uniquely made us known to the Father and his purposes. 
made known to us the Father and his purposes. Excuse me. Jesus Christ is the one who reveals the Father to us. He is the means by which the Father obtains true worshipers. Worshiping in spirit and truth involves acknowledging Jesus as the truth. It also means receiving from him the Holy Spirit who is available to all who believe in him. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, the true temple of God is raised up and the Holy Spirit is poured out on God's people. Unless we are born of the Spirit, we cannot worship God. Therefore, worshiping in the Spirit cannot be distinguished from worshiping in truth. The provision of the Spirit is made possible by the work of Jesus, who is the truth. By the glorification of Christ through his death and the resurrection, the Spirit who is called the Spirit of truth, John 14, 17, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, is given. It is the Spirit who reveals Christ to us because the Spirit's work is in us, because of that, we are able to respond in faith and obedience to Christ. First Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12.1, Paul writes, Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except of the Holy Spirit. And then 1 Corinthians 2, 6-14, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, Although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this for if they had they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written what no eye has seen no ear has heard no heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him. So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the Word, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And the final big picture thought that we're going to look at tonight about worship is answering the question, how should we worship God through spiritual disciplines? He writes, as we've considered what the Bible says about worship, now let us consider our second goal of the lesson to understand the relationship between worship and the disciplines. Our all of life worship is expressed through the disciplines both individually and corporately. The worship is both a spiritual discipline and yet it's also expressed through practicing all the spiritual disciplines individually and corporately. First as individuals. Worship ought to manifest itself in our living. It is not limited to certain times of the week. A.W. Tozer wrote in this vein, and this is, if you like checked out for a moment, check back in because this is a powerful truth. He says this, if you will not worship God seven days a week, you do not worship him one day a week. Our God is worthy of our worship every day of our lives. This begins, this brings us again to Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We also saw earlier this verse makes clear that worship involves our whole lives. In response to what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, we are to present ourselves to him as living sacrifices. Christ's obedience makes possible a new obedience for God's people as those who have been brought From death to life, through Jesus' death and resurrection, we now belong to God. The sacrifice we offer is not some specific form of, of praise or service, but our bodies themselves. The sacrifice we're called to make requires a complete dedication of our service to God. This means obedience to God that is motivated by what Christ has done for us in the gospel. Individual worship includes praising God with our words, Hebrews 13, 15. 
Our go- the gospel ministry, Romans 15, 16. Financial giving, giving Romans 15, 27. And serving one another, Philippians 4, 18. Notice here how worship encompasses some of the other spiritual disciplines, such as evangelism and stewardship and service. Corporate worship does not, in- does not exclude individual worship. As Don Whitney writes, Can we expect the flames of our worship of God to burn brightly in in public on the Lord's day when they barely flicker for him in secret on other days. Is Is it it because we do not worship well in private that our corporate worship experience often dissatisfies us? That's a good punch in the gut right there. Matter of fact, I'm gonna read it again. Listen to it. Can we expect the flames of our worship of God to burn brightly in public on the Lord's day when they barely flicker for him in secret on other days? Isn't it because we do not worship well in private that our corporate worship experiences often dissatisfies us? So basically kind of what Whitney is saying here is that you need to prepare yourself for corporate worship during the week. You need to be worshiping. If you worship God well as an individual, then you will you will have your fire for God stoked when those flames come together as one in worship. You know, a lot of times I think when people say, ah, I'm not really getting very much out of worship, preacher, that may say more about their engagement with God during the week than it does about what went on in the worship service that morning. Then again, it may not, so granted, I, need, I may need to preach better. All right, he says the New Testament emphasize, em, the New Testament emphasis is that people of God worship Him in their individual lives and in their family lives. When together they worship Him corporately. Such times of corporate worship are only one aspect of continual worship that each of us is to offer the Lord in the sacrifice of our bodies day to day. Next, we not only should we worship with spiritual disciplines as individuals, but also together with other believers. Corporate worship is a particular expression of the total life response of worship that we are to render to God. Gathering together is an important means of encouraging one another to persevere in Christ in love and obedience to Him. In other words, our corporate worship fuels our individual worship. And I would say just the opposite is true as well. Our individual worship fuels our corporate worship. As Christians come together as a local body of believers, we engage with God corporately as the family of God. It's what Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The Apostle Paul also regularly uses terminology of edification rather than the language of worship to indicate the purpose and the function of Christian gatherings. The church in assembly is not only approaches God, but it provides encouragement to its members. In the assembly, Christians build up one another. When Christians gather together to minister the truth of God uh, to one another in love, the church is manifested, maintained, and built up. In the giving and receiving of various ministries, Christians may encounter God and submit themselves to him afresh in praise and obedience, repentance and faith. Ministry exercised for the building up of the body of Christ is a significant way of worshiping and glorifying God. We don't attend Sunday services in order to obtain some private spiritual experience. Scripture knows nothing of an individualistic Lone Ranger Christianity. Scripture does not know of a Christian living in isolation from other believers. The New Testament describes the church as a body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13, and a household, Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Therefore, to be a Christian is to be a part of an individual in a body of believers, a local church. A major in which we worship corporately is through encouraging, a major concept in which we worship corporately is through encouraging and being encouraged by others. For instance, when we sing praises, 
we not only sing to God, but also edify one another by speaking truth to one another through our songs. We address one another in songs, in hymns, in spiritual songs. Ephesians 5, 19. This is the reason why we cannot engage in corporate worship through a TV or a radio broadcast or over the internet. Scripture commands us to assemble with other believers for the purpose of approaching God with other Christians for mutual edification. And before I read the closing thoughts here, I just want to say something about that. There is no substitute for corporate worship as the people of God come together to sing the word, pray the word, preach the word, encourage each other with the word. All right, so like that's essential to who we are as believers. And the reason I say that is because I hear from time to time people say, well, you know, I feel closer to God when I blank. You know, hunters say, you know, when I'm out in the woods. Well, I feel close to God when I'm out in the woods too. I like to be that, to see creation. I feel close to God when I'm standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. I feel close to God when I'm, when I'm at, the, uh, at the beach with Misty looking out there. I feel close to God when I'm taking the trash down the road. And I look up at my stars and I see uh, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and Orion and, you know, all these different constellations that I know and I know some of the background history. And so I feel close to God in all those ways. But none of those things are a substitute for the people of God coming together with our flames lit, putting together as one and worshiping the God that deserves our adoration, our affection, and our glory. Two more paragraphs, we're done. Concluding thoughts. Worship is both an end and a means. Worship is an end in its Worship is an end in itself because worship is for the glory of God. It is engaging with God on the terms that he proposes and in the way that he alone makes possible. At the same time, worship is also a means to godliness. We become like, like whom or what we worship. That is an important thought. Whatever you value above all things, that's what shapes you. We become like whom or what we worship. As we worship God in spirit and in truth, go in conforming image of his Son. Consider the object of our worship, the glorious and majestic creator and redeemer God. Remember what he has graciously, graciously done for us in Christ. Read God's word and pray that the Spirit would stir our hearts with the truth. Allow scripture, prayer, song, and our relationships with other Christians to encourage us in our worship. Let us also eagerly long for the day when we gather around God's throne in an innumerable multitude of, to praise him and to praise him for all of eternity. All right, that's the end of a lesson tonight on worship. There's a lot in that. Let's close with prayer and we'll go to our D groups. Father, we thank you for these six weeks of intentional focus on spiritual disciplines. And Lord, I, we ended with worship because of the reality that worship in itself is a spiritual discipline, yet all the other spiritual disciplines lead us to more godly, more biblical worship. So Father, I pray as we go into our, our D groups tonight that you give us great discussions around the, this concept so that the very thing that we were created for, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, that we might do that more fully, that you might get the glory, and as Piper says, we might get the joy as you are seen as the utmost in our affections. Thank you for the gift of worship. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll go to our D groups now.